Good morning and welcome to you on this uh, August 29th, uh, 2021, the last Sunday in August. This is the 14th uh, Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Welcome to you. Uh, we continue to give a big thank you to you, our donors who have so generously supported us all this year and last year you have made all the difference for the viability and flourishing, in fact, of our ministry here at Armour Heights. Thank you to you, and thank you for all the many ways you have encouraged and inspired us to do all that we do. Thank you. Thank you also to our worship team. Uh, again, without this worship team, we would not be who we are and where we are. And there's the people you see and the people you don't see. We are so thankful for everyone who makes Armour Heights the community that it is. Thank you. Um, there will be details forthcoming about uh, the opening again for in-person worship of the church. Uh, you will have to wait till next week as we begin September for all those details, but stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, for those of you who rely on our live streaming, that is now a permanent feature of who we are at Armour Heights, and we will continue to provide all those means, online means, uh, for you to totally feel connected and part of our community. Um, and now our worship uh, theme this morning, does God have a plan for your life and mine? Is there a reason and a purpose for everything? You know, But then what about all those bad, unfortunate, and terrible things that happen? How does that fit in to any larger purpose? This is our theme as we worship this morning. And now please join with me in our call to worship. Now Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up to the mountain to pray. We come to church to pray and to learn how to pray. We come to find God and listen for a special word from God to us and our situation. We come to find our purpose and to measure our life purpose. We come to find faith and hope and inspiration to love. Let us worship God together and now let us sing our hymn, uh, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Uh, if you are following a hymn book, it's number 321.
In our prayers of approach, confession, and the Lord's Prayer, let us bow down. Let us pray. We are here, O God, to grow our faith. Doubts and questions are important, but they can also swallow us up and fill us with uncertainty and fear. And so we are here to grow our faith, O God. We are here to grow our hope. Too many things happen to us and to others beyond our control, and we can become overwhelmed with stress, a fatalism, and hopelessness. We are here to grow our hope, O God. We are here to grow our love. Too many things happen to wound and hurt us, O God. People say things and do things whether they mean to or not. It still hurts. It still turns our hearts upside down. And it can even poison our spirits. We are here to worship, to grow our love, O oh God. Hear us in the silence as we confess to you what burdens our spirits most these days. You call us, O oh God, through the ups and downs, the successes and the failures, the good choices and the mistakes. You call us to rediscover our purpose as your children. You call us to discover or rediscover the conviction that you have a plan for us, and it is always available for us if we find somehow the courage, the grace, the clarity, and the love to choose it. Reveal it to us anew as we worship you this hour, O God. And we pray now as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you all. And so how will you share the peace of Christ today and this coming week? Amen.
our scripture readings, first from the Older Testament, the book of Exodus. This is uh, an account of Moses coming down from the mountain uh, after he has been in the presence of God. And uh, he has with him the commandments. And so we listen from Exodus 34, beginning at verse 29. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation of Israel returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with the Lord, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with God. Amen. And also reading from the Gospels, this uh, reading, uh, it will be uh, the version we find in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 36, is an account of the Transfiguration. Often we read such accounts on Transfiguration Sunday, which is Sunday before the beginning of the season of Lent, and yet it is also relevant for our theme today, and so we hear this now and Listen to the resonances with Moses and Jesus and the pattern fitting in. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings or tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in these day, those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Amen. We are listening, O God. Speak to us. Does God have a plan for you, for me? Some people believe in fate. Many movies and books seem to be captivated by the idea that everything happens for a reason, that, that things come to be in our lives as they were meant to be. Whether it's the career path we have been on, the people we meet who become pivotal for the fulfillment of our lives, the circumstances that direct things in a certain way. It seems that many people, people like us, would love to believe that this is all part of some larger plan.
plan. Why? Well, one reason for sure is that we are all looking for certainty. You know? We're all looking for some assurance that we have chosen right and that things have fallen in the right places for us. We even want to believe that the bad things that have happened in our lives have some positive purpose in store for us. We want to believe deep inside us that life's goodness, it will achieve its intended outcome in our lives in some way at some point, and we will live to tell the story. However, however, there are enough things that happen in our lives and in our world to, to shake us up, especially if we are committed to the truth more than to wishful thinking. If we have the courage to really see, then we cannot be so sure that things happen the way they should. In fact, there's, there's so much that happens that we cannot rationalize or explain in positive terms. Think about what's happening now in, in many places of the world. For those running from terror or hunger or, or natural disaster, or here in Canada among indigenous peoples for, for missing and murdered women and children who have survived, who have never survived the horrors of, of residential schooling? And what about those who got sick and even died from COVID? Those who were vulnerable elderly or, or healthcare workers or those in factories or, or those in, in work situations that had to risk safety to feed their families. We cannot be so smug and spouting cheap certainties that things happen for some larger reason according to some plan. And I know, I know, many of you worshiping right now have suffered some terrible things and some terrible losses. And so the last thing I would want to promote is this simplistic, superficial, and insensitive idea that everything that has happened is part of some larger purpose. But, but, does this mean that there is no larger purpose and plan we can tap into? Does this mean we're just, you know, accidents of nature, totally dependent on the randomness and chance of an indifferent universe? Does it mean that it's all up to us and our choices, even though we make mistakes and even though so much happens beyond our control? No, no, it's not all up to us. The God revealed in the biblical story is a God with a vision, a purpose, and a plan, a plan for everything, for everyone, for us. But how that plan lives itself out has room for infinite diversity. The key, according to this story, is to discern how the plan works in our lives and how it does not. The Bible rejects fate. All things don't happen for some larger reason that fulfills some larger purpose or plan, even though there are many parts of the Bible that may seem to suggest this to be the case. There are terrible things that happen that God does not will, things that break God's heart. That's the way the story is told. And yet, under the right conditions, God can work with the randomness, the chance, and, and even the tragedies of life. God can work, even with, with mistakes and failures, God can work to create something beautiful in our lives and through our lives. How is that? Let's ponder our scripture readings for guidance. Our Old Testament reading captures a key moment in the life of Moses as he descends Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. 
His face is radiant, so radiant, in fact, that he has to cover his face so that people treat him like a person rather than a god. Given the proclivity of the people to fabricate idols, Moses wants to remind them that it is the one God who gave them these commandments and that they worship this God alone, not Moses. But how did Moses become such a pivotal leader, teacher, priest, prophet of Israel? Was it all part of some plan? Was it fate? Was it his destiny? Well, God had a dream for the people of Israel, a dream that captured the imagination of of the patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham, Sarah, and many generations after them. And Moses came onto the scene centuries later, and he also was captivated by this dream. But this only happened later in his life. Many things contributed to him being the right leader at the right time to lead the people out of slavery, but these things were not preordained or planned out in advance. It wasn't God's will that all the firstborn Israelites were slaughtered by Pharaoh, which led to Moses' parents hiding him in a basket in a pond, which then led to Pharaoh's daughter being out in the pond for a bath at the right time and spotting the little baby, loving him instantly and adopting him as her own. And it wasn't God who worked it all out that Moses' sister Miriam saw all this and offered her mother's services as a wet nurse for Moses to the Pharaoh's daughter which then opened the door for Moses' mother to also teach him all about his roots as a Hebrew, even as he grew up learning Egyptian and royal politics in the court of the Pharaoh, which would serve him down the road. And it wasn't God's will that Moses murder an Egyptian in in defense of a Hebrew, but then having to flee into the wilderness, where he eventually meets his new family and gains his new career as a sheep herder, which then leads him many years later to be on a mountain herding sheep when he witnesses the the, the burning bush and God speaking to him this dream of, of liberation for his people. And it wasn't all predetermined that Moses would embrace this dream and his role in all this, you know, because he had serious self questioning of his abilities and, and severe doubts. But, but, given the way things worked out and the choices Moses made for good and for ill, we can trace back all the little and big events of his life and the life of the Hebrews to witness the incredible and miraculous purpose and dream of God fulfilled. God's plan and dream were for the liberation of the people from slavery how that would unfold, and if it would unfold, depended on the inspiration and choices of particular human beings and their response to the random and not so random events and circumstances. It is because Moses was inspired somehow and empowered that he had the courage to choose the way he did and see God working the way he did. If Moses gave in to his fear and despair, things would never have worked out the way they did. The possibilities in him and for his people would not have worked out the way they did. So, there is a randomness and a freedom to the way things work out. But it doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan and it doesn't mean that God cannot be involved and inspire us to serve that plan if, if, We have the discernment, the vision, the courage, the faith, the hope and love and partner with God, all of which we need so that we discern God's will and choose it courageously at every stage of our lives. And this brings me to Peter in the Gospels. Jesus chooses Peter to be the leader among the disciples. Yet for all the possibility in Peter and all the potential, there is incredible immaturity, 
and a lack of self-awareness, which leads to cowardice and ultimate failure and abandonment of Jesus. Peter makes great claims for himself in his devotion to Jesus, but he resists Jesus' path when it's leading to Jerusalem, and then in spite of great promises to stick, it with, Je stick with Jesus even unto death, he abandons him. Why? Because he is petrified, he is afraid for his life. And yet, and yet, God uses Peter's tragic failure to fulfill a wonderful purpose. And Peter becomes the leader he becomes by growing through his failure, coming to terms with it. It makes him a different human being. God didn't cause Peter's failure, nor was it God's will that Peter fail. That wasn't the plan. Jesus didn't call Peter with a view that this is the way Peter's possibilities would work themselves out. But God's plan was fulfilled in this way. Human choices and the random circumstances of life, the good and the bad, they can become the way God's plan works itself out in particular human lives, in our lives. And finally, there is Jesus himself. God didn't send Jesus into the world to die, no matter what you've heard before. God's, the way the gospel story is told is quite different. You know, God sent Jesus into the world to fulfill the purpose of, of turning the world back to God, especially human creatures who are the biggest problem on this planet. Jesus came to understand himself as the Messiah, but how would that role work itself out? On the mountain, he is transfigured and declared to be the beloved of God, the one everyone should listen to. But for all Jesus' creative efforts to, to woo his people, to turn back to God's way of love rather than, than the militant hatred of their enemies they had been taught from the time they were born, you know, for all his efforts, Jesus failed in that. You know, Israel's leadership, they were stubbornly bent against the way of forgiving love. Salvation would only come by annihilating their enemies and becoming a glorious nation on top of the world. And by the end of Holy Week, they had managed to turn the people against Jesus. But here's the remarkable thing. Jesus begins to see, even in advance of Holy Week, his suffering and death, he begins to see in that another way, as a more profound way for love to win in a world of brokenness and evil and tragedy. Jesus sees in his way through death a more powerful way of communicating God's eternal love, which, which can convert the hardest of hearts to the wholeness of salvation. But to save the world, nothing less than a conversion of hearts to forgiving love is required. It's definitely not a given, and the world we see today is a sign of that. The biggest enemy is the power of hate and bitterness, which polarizes, demonizes, and, and divides human beings from one another. By communicating, forgiving love, even in the face of cruel rejection and death, Jesus proclaims the final and greatest parable of God's kingdom. God is the one now crucified by us humans in every person we crucify. And it's crucified, we crucify God because we are afraid of what God's purpose is for us. You know, we reject it and prefer to create our own purposes. We don't need God. But God's purpose is for us to bless the world the way we have been blessed. If we are loved infinitely and forgiven, then we must learn how to love and forgive others the way God loves and forgives us. That's the plan. The cross itself embodies this in the most powerful way possible, and that's why it's the center of the gospel drama. So what about you and me? 
through all the distinctive ways we are each unique and different human beings, you know, through each of our own personalities, gifts, talents, interests, concerns, through each of the ways we have um, known experiences, the backgrounds of our cultures and, and our personal random circumstances of our lives, the way we have been formed. Through all of this, God is calling us to work out this divine plan and purpose for our lives, to bless the world somehow, and to love the world and all who live in it, but to find our own unique way to fulfill this love according to the options before us and opportunities that come our way and based on who we are. God knows each of us. God has a plan for each of us. What is the same for all of us is that this plan is about the power of love through faith and hope to bless the world in some way. That's God's plan for each of us. <clears throat> but what is unique and distinctive for each of us is how the randomness and chance circumstances of our lives, even the failures and mistakes, but also the gifts and talents, the regrets, but also the blessings. How will all this become part of the way we find unique ways in ourselves to bless the world through the love God is working out in our hearts. How? You know, some of us, we can articulate the purpose of our lives very clearly. You know, some of us can trace God's presence and movement in our lives as we look back, as we see our lives now, as we look to the future. For others of us, there is much too much self-questioning, doubt, regret, shame even, anger, frustration at the way life has worked out for us and the way things have happened to us outside of our choosing. Many of us, our hearts have been wounded, if not broken, by losses or abuses that we cannot just forget. To find God's purpose of love for us through, through ever new faith and hope, it's the biggest of challenges. And yet, and yet, as we discover God in the particular crosses of our lives, as we find that God in Christ crucified has always been there with us, as we find God promising to make out of the shattered and broken pieces of our lives something infinitely precious and beautiful, as all this begins to happen in us, perhaps we can find some new purpose. Perhaps we can find our way to, to God's plan for us. Perhaps we can find our way again to the power of love, to heal, to grow, and to bless the world through us. May God find us, and may we find God, and may we find new life in God's purpose and plan for our lives. Wherever we have come, wherever we have got however we have got here and however long we've got left as we move into tomorrow. Amen.
And in the valley of the shadows, when death is crouching near, deep within the stillness are words your heart can hear. Hold my hand, I will walk with you, step by step. In our prayers of thanksgiving and pastoral concern, let us bow down. Let us pray. Thank you, O God. You walk with us throughout our lives. Sometimes as we look out and see the beauty of our world, as we see the beauty in people around us, as we experience the light in ourselves and what we can enjoy, as we see your presence with us and around us. We see your presence, O God. At other times, O God, life can be a painful, lonely, conflicted, fearful, uncertain, and frustrating affair, where your presence seems far away, if at all, a factor in our lives. And yet we are gathered for worship, and we gather for worship week in, week out, to get grounded again in an awareness and a gratitude for your presence in our lives. Perhaps as we call upon you anew, as you give us new eyes to see and new ears to hear, as you open up new ways for us to think about life and see light where we have only seen dark, perhaps, O oh God, Gratitude for your presence and new possibility for our lives can become more real. Hear us now as we, take, as we make a deliberate effort to thank you for particular blessings and mercies in our lives in the silence. Hear us, O oh God, as we also make a conscious effort to pray with our hearts for the pain and suffering of many in our world. Even as much has been done to defeat COVID through vaccinations, O oh God, COVID has revealed the vast inequities in our world. There are nations and parts of the world where vaccinations have yet to reach people. There are vast inequities in the health resources people have to manage the virus, to care for people who are sick and feed those hungry and homeless. Have mercy, O oh God. Keep us mindful of what needs to change in our world and remind us of such priorities when we vote in our governments. Only in the welfare and well-being of all is our own welfare and well-being to be found. Only when the well-being of the most vulnerable is our top priority will we find rest and fullness in our own souls. We pray for refugees the world over, for those without the basics of life. We pray for those struggling with their mental health, their employment, their vocation, the burden of caring for a loved one with little relief in sight. We pray for young people who have had a summer with no camping, 
the loss of many activities and programs, and minimal employment opportunities. As school will open again, we, we pray for teachers and, and students, especially those for whom this last year has been a poor one for learning and focus. We can feel overwhelmed and hopeless, O oh God. And yet we make the effort and sometimes shed tears because it enlarges us as human beings to do so, and it is our way of fulfilling your purpose for us toward our world, to love ever more deeply and richly as we are loved by you. Finally, we take a moment to name before you in the silence, O oh God, those persons and situations in our lives we are carrying extra heavily, persons who need your compassion, and situations which need your mercy and grace. We pray for healing, O oh God. We pray for new life, O oh God. And we pray for peace, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us sing together our closing hymn. This is my Father's world, number 328, if you are following the hymn book. that has come in Jesus Christ, the love who is God, and the energy and power of such grace and love we name Holy Spirit, come upon each and every one of you and be with you this day and forevermore.